Psalm 53 To the chief musician upon Mahalath Mastil a psalm of David The fool has said in his heart There is no God Corrupt are these And have done abominable iniquity There is none that doeth good God looked down from heaven Upon the children of men To see if there were any that did understand That did seek God Every one of them is gone back They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread. They have not called upon God. There were they in great fear, where no fear was. For God has scattered the bones of him, that encampeth against thee. Thou hast put them to shame, because God hath despised them. O oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when God bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel be glad. Amen. May God bless to us the reading of his own Holy word. So our theme this evening is Dawkins' Delusion. Dawkins' Delusion. This then is meant to be a review of the uh, book called The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is a family professor for the public understanding of science at Oxford University. He has been nicknamed Darwin's Rottweiler because of his zeal in defending the atheistic evolutionary hypothesis. It's scarcely a theory because it's not even potentially capable of of proof. But he is zealous in defending this particular view. His book, The God Delusion, It contains 374 pages in defense of atheism. It also contains a list of addresses to help people who have been trapped by religion uh, to escape into the acclaimed liberty of atheism. It is written in a fairly popular style with plenty of illustrative stories and anecdotes which generally tend to describe and illustrate the point that don't actually uh, establish or prove anything. But this is partly what makes the book so long. It is not possible to go through every detail of such a lengthy book in one address. And so we must adopt what might be called a broad brush approach, dealing with the main elements, many of which are uh, evident very early on in the book. Dawkins does not pull punches, and neither shall we. First of all, Dawkins makes an irrational assumption throughout about human reason. Dawkins makes an irrational assumption throughout about human reason. He assumes that human reason is reliable without giving any reasonable grounds for believing this. He contradicts his main practice at the very starting line. Dawkins' whole approach is that human reason is supreme. But if you're going to say that human reason is supreme, you have to have a reason for believing that human reason is supreme. You have to reasonably prove by means of human reason that human reason is reliable. And of course that cannot be done. 
because to attempt to prove it is to assume its truth. And so there is a contradiction at the very starting gate. He assumes, but never proves, what man is and what man is not. From the outset, he assumes that our reason is reliable. But I'll give you a later reference on page 282, Dawkins tells us, By contrast, what I as a scientist believe, for example, evolution, I believe not because of reading a holy book, but because I have studied the evidence. It really is a very different matter. Books about evolution are believed not because they are holy, they are believed because they present overwhelming quantities of mutually buttressed evidence. In principle, any reader can go and check that evidence. When a science book is wrong, somebody eventually discovers a mistake and it is corrected in subsequent books. And he defends this position, he says, philosophers especially amateurs with a little philosophical learning, and even more especially those infected with, quote, cultural relativism, end quote, may raise a tiresome red herring at this point. A scientist's belief in evidence is itself a matter of fundamentalist faith. I have dealt with this elsewhere and will only briefly repeat myself here. All of us believe in evidence in our lives, whatever we may profess with our amateur philosophical hats on. If I am accused of murder and prosecuting counsel sternly asks me whether it is true that I was in Chicago on the night of the crime, I cannot get away with a philosophical evasion. And so he argues we work by evidence in our everyday life we regard as true that which we perceive with our senses. And his position is that the available evidence makes the existence of God improbable. And so chapter 4 is entitled Why There Almost Certainly Is No God. But this will not do. Evidence is perceived by the senses and testimony is only reliable is if the witness has no vested interest. So behind Dawkins' assumptions about human reason and his own reason in particular, there are several other assumptions, none of which this man who made so much boast about human reason ever actually reasonably justifies. First of all, behind this assumption about reason is the assumption that man is not a sinner who wants to escape from the true God. He assumes that man is not a sinner and that his reason is not affected by sin. And so he says, on the face of it, the Darwinian idea that evolution is driven by natural selection seems ill-suited to explain such goodness as we possess our feelings of morality, decency, empathy and pity. Um, chapter 6 is, head, is headed, The Roots of Morality, Why Are We Good? But are we good? He assumes we're good. And is our reason reliable and objective? Considering the denunciations of so many people contained in this book, it's difficult to see why he believes that man is not a sinner, but he, he, he seems to assume that human nature is not a sinful nature and therefore that reason is not 
credulous. And he assumes also that we have no need of revelation outside of what we perceive with our sense, with our senses. Dawkins presupposes that we need no written revelation. So much so that he despises what is called noma, and I'll explain, or I'll let him explain what he means by the term uh, as we proceed. On page 55, he refers to a man called Gould. Gould carried the art of bending over backwards to positively supine lengths in one of his less admired books, Rocks of Ages. There he coined the acronym NOMA for the phrase non-overlapping magisteria. And he quotes Gould, the net or magisterium of science covers the empirical realm, that's what we perceive in our senses. What is the universe made of, fact, and why does it work this way, theory? The magisterium of religion extends over questions of ultimate meaning and moral value. These two magisteria do not overlap, nor do they encompass all inquiry. Consider, for example, the magisterium of art and the meaning of beauty. To cite the old cliches, science gets the age of rocks and religion the rock of ages. Science studies how the heavens go, religion how to go to heaven. That's the end of the quotation. And Dawkins goes on, this sounds terrific, right up until you give it a moment's thought. What are these ultimate questions in whose presence religion is an honoured guest and science must respectfully slink away? Martin Rees, the distinguished Cambridge astronomer, whom I have already mentioned, begins his book, Our Cosmic Habitat, by posing two candidate ultimate questions and giving a noma-friendly answer. The preeminent mystery, quote, the preeminent mystery is why anything exists at all, what brings life into the equations and actualizes them in a real cosmos. Such questions lie beyond science, however. They are the province of philosophers and theologians. I would prefer to say that if indeed they lie beyond science, they most certainly lie beyond the province of theologians as well. And then he goes on to say, what expertise can theologians bring to deep cosmological questions that scientists cannot? In another book I recounted the words of an Oxford astronomer who, when I asked him one of those same deep questions, said, ah, now we move beyond the realm of science, this is where I have to hand over to our good friend the chaplain. I was not quick-witted enough to utter the response that I later wrote. But why the chaplain? Why not the gardener or the chef? Why are scientists so cravenly respectful towards the ambitions of theologians over questions that theologians are certainly no more qualified to answer than scientists themselves? Now you see what Dawkins is saying. He's saying that uh, there is no revelation, there is no theology, and science is all there is. And so he says, similarly, we can all agree that science's entitlement to advise us on moral values is problematic, to say the least. But does Gould really want to cede to religion the right to tell us what is good and what is bad? The fact that it has nothing else to contribute to human wisdom is no reason to hand religion a free license to tell us what to do. So what Dawkins is saying is, there is only science. There's no revelation uh, from God, and it doesn't come into the picture. Theologians are a waste of space. Theology is a non-subject, and so on. We agree with his rejection of the two separate Magisteria, the idea that there's religion and there's science and we keep them completely separate. But the problem is that Dawkins has got it the wrong way around. He says forget about the religion, science is everything. But the truth of the matter is that biblical revelation 
that is, special revelation from God, is to govern the study of general revelation in the creation. In other words, science is to be subservient to the truth of God revealed in Scripture. There are, he's right, there are two separate fields disconnected, but it is biblical theology that is dominant and is to cover everything. So that without that biblical theology, without the knowledge of the truth of Scripture, the creation is not studied correctly. But Dawkins presupposes that the creation is just there, and it isn't general revelation of the glory of God, and that special revelation doesn't exist. Scripture is a special revelation from God. So he assumes his reason is reliable, and that assumption is irrational. He assumes that he is not a sinner who hates God and is dependent upon God both to give him his word and to renew his heart and will to receive it. He irrationally assumes but never proves what a man is. And if you don't do that, if he doesn't know what a man is, and he, ass he asserts the supremacy of human reason, how can he assume the supremacy of a reason of a creature that he doesn't know what it is? And he cannot prove what a man is and what his reason is. So why does Dawkins believe that he's not a sinner with a natural anti-God agenda? Why does he believe that he is a product of evolution with a reason that is competent and unbiased and can be made the final authority. He has no reason to believe it. He simply asserts that this is so in blind faith. It is because he wishes it to be so. He wishes to believe that he is not a sinful creature who hates his creator but he has no rational basis for that, and therefore his presupposition that human reason is reliable is irrational. He simply asserts it. I'm not a sinner. Therefore my reason is fine. But he never can prove it. You say, oh, but... Christians like us, we have presuppositions too, and that's quite true. But our presuppositions are not contradictory. Our presupposition is that the God of Scripture is, the Bible is His Word, and we need the renewing of the Holy Spirit in order to receive that truth. But Dawkins' presupposition contains an inherent contradiction. You can't say reason is supreme without reasonably proving it. He wants to believe it. But the real explanation is in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 19. <coughs> because that which may be known of God <coughs> is manifestly in them. For God has showed it unto them so the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed for ever. And verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. 
That's why Dawkins chooses to assume the reliability and finality of human reason. Because he holds down the truth in unrighteousness and does not want to retain God in his knowledge. Chapter 3 contains arguments for God's existence. And he looks at some of the standard theistic proofs. Mainly those proofs are that there must be a first cause and the order in creation, the evidence of design and of goal and so on. It has to be said that the mistake that even some very godly men have made is to treat these as proofs rather than what we prefer to call testimonies. In other words, these things are not a starting point from which we then, by process of deduction, prove the existence of God. The creation is not a basis of proof. The heavens declare the glory of God. They don't form the, form the beginning of a process. We must not allow unbelief any legitimacy. We must not allow that the problem is getting the stages of a deduction process right. As if Dawkins has just made a, a, a morally neutral mistake. And if we just get the argument right, well, he'll see it. No, he won't. We must not treat unbelief as anything but sin. If there were no sin, everyone would immediately know the that, that there was a God, that they would see his eternal power and Godhead clearly in the things that are made. So atheism is not due to lack of proof, it's due to sin. Dawkins asserts the supremacy of human reason because he wants it to be so and in so doing he acts unreasonably and sinfully. Secondly, Dawkins professed objectivity is a pretense. Dawkins professed objectivity is a pretense. This is just the follow-through of the above. He begins his second chapter before he has endeavoured to establish or prove anything with the following. It is blasphemous, but we need to understand Dawkins. He says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably, arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynist, homophobic, racist, infant infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now, I'm sorry to have to read that. It is blasphemy, but we need to know that that was written in the sec beginning of the second chapter before he's tried to prove anything. And he is posing as a man of reason. This is the man of science. And he comes out with this, this harangue, this tirade, this emotional outburst. That isn't be the result of reason. The reason he says things like that is not because he's reasonable, it's not because he's a scientist, it's because he's a sinner who is enraged against the almighty God in whose hand his breath is. He consistently appeals to human pride 
uh, by flattering those who will listen to him as intellectually courageous and heroic free thinkers over against buffoons who don't agree with him. And the word he constantly uses at several points when speaking of God is unpleasant, unpleasant, unpleasant. He doesn't like God. That's why he's an atheist. He pictures atheists as heroic martyrs. Page 4. American polls suggest that atheists and agnostics far outnumber religious Jews and even outnumber most other particular religious groups. Unlike Jews, however, who are notoriously one of the most effective political lobbies in the United States, and unlike evangelical Christians who wield even greater political power, atheists and agnostics are not organized and therefore exert almost zero influence. Indeed, organizing atheists has been compared to herding cats because they tend to think independently and will not conform to authority. Well, there's no big mystery there. If there's no God, there's no final authority and there's no source of authority amongst men. That's why atheistic countries generally tend to be either totalitarian or anarchic because there's no acknowledged source of authority. But he goes on to say, but a good first step would be to build a critical mass of those willing to come out, thereby encouraging others to do so. Even if they can't be heard, that cats in sufficient numbers can make a lot of noise and they cannot be ignored. The whole point here is that, uh, that he sees atheists as a poor, persecuted, downtrodden group of people. He says earlier, the status of atheists in America is on a par with that of homosexuals 50 years ago. Now, after the gay pride movement, it is possible, though still not very easy, for a homosexual to be elected to public office. A Gallup poll taken in 1999 asked Americans whether they would vote for an otherwise well-qualified person who was a woman, 95% would, Roman Catholic, 94% would, Jew, 90% percent would, black 92%, Mormon 79%, homosexual 79%, or atheist 49%. Clearly we have a long way to go, but atheists are a lot more numerous, especially among the educated elite than many realize. Well, there are very good reasons why people wouldn't, even in a largely ungodly society, still don't want atheists in power. But he presents atheists as a poor, persecuted uh, body of people. He seems to forget the thousands of Christian martyrs, past and present. He bracket, brackets Christianity and Islam together and conveniently forgets that it is uh, one thing for people to uh, put on an opera about Jerry Springer and blaspheme Christianity, but they wouldn't dare do so with Islam because they'd soon have a fatwa issued against them. He ignores that fact. And this also shows the difference that he, the different standards he applies to atheists and theists, those who say there's no God, those who say there is a God. On page 272, he admits that Stalin was evil. We'll come back to that in a moment. But he says, oh, but his atheism wasn't what made him evil. In other words, he selects. You've got the wrong atheist. He doesn't do that with theists. We're all responsible for what Osama bin Laden does, the American prosperity gospel con men. They're all lumped in together. When it comes to atheists, oh no, he's selected. Stalin killed millions of people precisely because he was an atheist. And so did Lenin 
Lenin was responsible for the deaths of multitudes, and so was Mao Zedong. But he conveniently forgets the multitudes, including Christians, who were slaughtered by his fellow atheists. But when it comes to things, we're all put under one umbrella. Evangelical Christians, Roman Catholics, Muslims, Buddhists. Any illustration does. Doesn't matter what religion it comes from. Thirdly, Dawkins does not understand biblical Christianity. Or if he does, he certainly conceals it. He does not understand biblical Christianity. He scarcely ever interacts with biblical Christianity. Most of his anecdotes come from Roman Catholicism, Islam, or American prosperity gospel, con men, and charismatics. I'll give him one point. He is bolder against Islam than most. I'll concede that to him. But he assumes that he understands the teaching of the Bible when he does not. He, of course, sees the God of the Old Testament as different from the New, but he doesn't want either. But he's constantly shadow boxing, using unbiblical religion as a reason for being an atheist. But he doesn't face up to the biblical view of God as a spirit infinite, eternal and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. He quotes what is spurious to oppose what is true. But biblical Christianity fully anticipates the, ans the existence of openly non-Christian religion and spurious forms of professed Christianity by reason of which the way of truth is evil spoken of. Dawkins has far more in common with Roman Catholicism, Islam, the prosperity gospel preachers, the Buddhists, whom he all, all of whom he criticizes, than he does with the true religion of the Bible. From the standpoint of biblical Christianity, Dawkins is in the same category as these. The Roman Catholic, the Muslim, the Buddhist, they all attribute some of what belongs to God to man. Dawkins attributes or tries to attribute to a finite man all that belongs all that belongs to God. In his view, man is God. Most false religions set up for something a bit less than that. But they attribute what belongs to God to man in some measure. He goes the whole hog. Instead of saying these things that should belong to God, some of them belong to man. He says, forget about God altogether. They all belong to man, except that man is not infinite. And so he can't quite go all the way. So in his view, man is God. And he and a few like-minded cronies at the top of the pile are the ones to whom less able people should do intellectual obeisance. Fourthly, Dawkins continues to use terms that his atheistic presupposition have rendered meaningless. He continues to use terms that his atheistic presupposition have re rendered meaningless. He quotes Darwin, very early on, page 12, Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is a grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, 
having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. There, Darwin uses the term beauty. But what does beauty mean to an atheist? On an atheistic view, beauty is simply the response in an evolved human on perceiving other aspects of the evolved universe. It has no meaning at all. It's just a reaction caused by one product of evolution upon another product of evolution. And it is an instinctive thing and it has no, there is no such thing as objective beauty. It is simply a reaction of one evolved being to the perception of other evolved beings. The term happy. What does the term happy mean? Is it merely a description of one instinctive emotion and sadness is another? And why is the one more desirable than the other? And does it matter? He quotes Einstein on page 209, chapter, title page. Einstein, he says, Strange is our situation here on earth. Each of us comes for a short visit, not knowing why yet sometimes seeming to divine a purpose. From the standpoint of daily life, however, there is one thing we do know, that man is here for the sake of other men, above all for those upon whose smiles and well-being our own happiness depends. What is this happiness? Does it matter? Does it matter what we feel? On Dawkins' view, this life is a meaningless interruption of nothing. That's what life is, a meaningless interruption of nothing. Begin, life begins from nothing. Our lives begin and we end up as nothing. So what significance is there in what we feel during this brief, meaningless interruption of nothing. Why should we care about other people? What's Einstein talking about? Why should we care about those close to us? Dawkins uses the term good and evil. What do those terms mean apart from God? He says Stalin was evil. What does that mean? It means nothing. He explains behavior, even caring for others in physical terms, the genes and so on. How do we call these good or evil? Hitler's proactive natural selection approach on this view, was not evil. It was just that he had different instincts to most other people. So really, what happens to our families or to our friends is meaningless. What happens to us is meaningless. There is no morality. There may be varying consensus, consensus as to what is desirable. If you were living in Nazi Germany, the bulk of the population supported the Nazis. Does that make the Nazis right, or are they outvoted by the fact that other people, other nations, didn't think Hitler was on the right track? There is no good and evil. He argues that goodness should not be dependent 
of believing that there is a God who sees us. Page 226. Put like that, the question sounds, uh, is there, if there is no God, why be good? Put like that, the question sounds positively ennobled. When a religious person puts it to me in this way, and many of them do, my immediate temptation is to issue the following challenge. Do you really mean to tell me the only reason you try to be good is to gain God's approval and reward or to avoid his disapproval and punishment? That's not morality, that's just sucking up, apple polishing, looking over your shoulder at the great surveillance camera in the sky or the still small wire trap inside your head, monitoring your every move, even your every base thought. As Einstein said, if people are good only because they fear punishment and hope for reward, then we are a sorry lot indeed. Michael Shermer in The Science of Good and Evil calls it a debate stopper. If you agree that in the absence of God you would commit robbery, rape and murder, you reveal yourself as an immoral person and we would be well advised to steer a wide course around you. If on the other hand you admit that you would continue to be a good person even when not under divine surveillance, you have fatally undermined your claim that God is necessary for us to be good. I suspect that quite a lot of religious people do think that religion is what motivates them to be good, especially if they belong to one of those faiths that systematically exploits personal guilt. Dawkins does not even understand biblical Calvinism and man's dependence upon God. He never deals with, the, with biblical Calvinism. He doesn't understand the biblical truth concerning God's absolute power and sovereignty and man's complete dependence upon him. But a sense of accountability is right. But without God, it's not only the question of accountability, it is God who defines good and evil. There is one lawgiver, that is God. Sin is the transgression of, of the law. <coughs> the terms good and evil have no meaning whatsoever within Dawkins' thought. He uses the terms because he can't avoid using them. But they have no meaning. There is no good and evil without God. God, by, uh, God is good, and what God is, commands or approves, is good. And love to God is the essence of all true goodness. So Professor Dawkins has never known true goodness in his heart, for he does not have a heart renewed by the Holy Spirit. There is no goodness without Acknowledge there is no the terms good and evil have no meaning without God. On page thirteen, he says Julian Pagini explains in atheism a very short introduction the meaning of an atheist's commitment to naturalism. He quotes what most atheists do believe is that although there is only one kind of stuff in the universe and it is physical, out of this stuff come minds, beauty, emotions, moral values, in short, the full gamut of phenomena that gives richness to human life. But that's nonsense. There can be no richness uh, in how can you call that a richness of life when it just has appeared. There is no yardstick for good or evil or beauty or anything else. And so the reference to richness is meaningless. Fifthly, Dawkins' pretense that something can come from nothing is dishonest. Dawkins' pretense that something can come from nothing is dishonest. In page 63, he begins, uh, a second paragraph, knowing that we are products of Darwinian evolution. He just goes on. Knowing that we are products of Darwinian evolution. 
In the Daily Telegraph of the 5th of January 2005, he is quoted as saying on the EDGE website, in response to the question, what do you believe is true even though you cannot prove it, he is quoted as saying, I believe, but I cannot prove that all life, all intelligence, all creativity, and all design in the universe is the direct or indirect product of Darwinian natural selection. That was one of his more honest moments. He admits he believes evolution, but he cannot prove it. Of course he can't prove it. And a moment's serious reflection would tell you that evolution is utterly incapable of proof. The origin of the universe is unknowable apart from revelation. We do not have time machines. No man was there. Science is meant to be the study, and should be under the light of God's word, the study, but even in Dawkins' terms, is meant to be the study of what exists by the senses, those senses assisted by complex machinery and so on. No one was there, no man was there, when the world was made. Therefore, any idea of how the earth came into existence without dependence upon divine revelation is always only a guess. I guess. That's all. A shot in the dark. And that is what evolution really is. An unbelieving guess. It merits no higher status than that. An unbelieving guess. Job 38 Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Where wast thou? Where was, where was Dawkins? He wasn't there. Neither was anybody else but God. And only God can tell us about origins. But the claim essential to atheistic evolution that at first something came of nothing is even more ludicrous. The theist, the Christian, says on the basis of scripture there is an eternal, independent creator, not subject to any laws, but the author of them. And then, as a result of his creating, we have the creation, the universe. The alternative is that there was nothing, and then there was something. Even Dawkins has to admit that. There was nothing, and then there was something. Now where has Dawkins or any other man ever witnessed or observed a process of nothing resulting in something? By Big Bang or whatever. But even though no scientist has ever witnessed any instance anywhere at any time of something coming from nothing, these men, men like Dawkins who profess to believe in fixed laws with no exceptions, are prepared to propagate an atheism that cannot stand if that is not true. 
to treat this as simply a glitch for which explanation may be forthcoming in due time is simply dishonest. It is simply dishonest. Dawkins acknowledges there may be unanswerable questions. Perhaps there are some genuinely profound and meaningful questions that are forever beyond the reach of science. Indeed there are. Without revelation, the question of origins is beyond science. And without the acknowledgement of God, the existence of anything is nonsense. And it is dishonest for him to overlook the utter irrationality of the idea of something coming from nothing. He has no empirical evidence anywhere for any such thing. The reason something came of nothing, because when there was nothing created, there was God, and he created. Sixthly, Dawkins is an atheist because he wants to be. Dawkins is an atheist because he wants to be. He spends a chapter trying to put altruistic motives on his zeal against God. He wants to deliver people from religious delusions and its effects. But life, if life is a meaningless farce that he makes it, why bother? There is no good and evil. Even the assumption that the human race, a completely ludicrous assumption, but the huge idea that the human race is advancing of its own accord apparently to better and better days, of what interest is that when we're all going to end up as nothing anyway? Your life, your family life, all that you do is just a meaningless task. you end up as nothing, same as Hitler and Stalin. Just nothing. Nothing has meaning. So why is Dawkins so keen to spread this nothingness idea? Does he really have an altruistic motive? Does he think that people who are going to nothing need his help? Because the end result will be just the same whatever he does. The real reason why Dawkins is an atheist is because he wants to be. And the reason he wants to be is that he is a sinner against God and he hates him. That's really all there is to it. He is an atheist because he wants to be an atheist and he wants to be an atheist because he hates God. Dawkins is fully accounted for in Genesis chapter 3. There's no surprise in the existence of people like Dawkins. First of all, the rejection of dependence on God for knowledge. Verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The rejection of dependence on God for knowledge. There it is, in the fall of man. The desire to work out our own morality, independently of God. Secondly, the desire to get away from the true God against whom we have sinned. Verse 8 to 10. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. There's Adam and Eve, they've sinned against God. 
they surely knew that God could find them in the trees. But they wanted to pretend, let's hide in the trees, away from God. And that's what Dawkins is doing. But he's more like an ostrich. He buries his head in the sand and says, there is no God. Well, then maybe there won't be. But of course there will be. Dawkins puts man in the place of God, as we've seen, and pretends that God isn't there. He has, of course, nothing meaningful to offer, but he fulminates against Christianity, against places like Emmanuel College Gate said. These places remind him of God, and he doesn't want to be reminded of God. He says he wants to rescue people from religion. But not out of love to them, but out of hatred toward God. Dawkins is a good marketing man. No doubt that's why this professorship of public understanding of science exists to have someone like Dawkins propagate absurdity under the cloak of silence. He's a good communicator. He knocks about a lot of interesting stories with bits of technical stuff to dazzle people. But he doesn't do much else. His appeal is to little men who like to pose as thinkers and gather a bit of information to give the impression that they're thinkers and enjoy the inner glow of feeling that they're in the know. And at the same time, they can do what they want and ignore the idea of accountability to God. But Dawkins offers meaninglessness on a thoroughly irrational footing. Man must be assumed good and uncreated. Everything must have originally come from nothing, and evolution must be true. He gives no rational basis for any of these things. Those who put their faith in Dawkins will perish with them. But Christians believe God, the God of truth. They trust in the Saviour, Jesus Christ, who bore the guilt of sin. We know whom we have believed, and it's not Richard Dawkins.